here is chapter or section 5.2 and this chapter is going to deal uh, specifically with the structure of viruses what the viruses look like and so we're going to look at the function and structure of viral capsids the outer coating of the virus distinguish between enveloped and what are called naked viruses and look at the importance of viral surface proteins or what are referred to as spikes and we'll actually look at quite a few of these um, figures and tables down here in Objective 10. So as a group, viruses are the smallest infectious agents. And what you see here in Figure 5.1 is the picture of a yeast cell. Yeast cell is pretty small, 7 micrometers. The yeast cell is um, something that you can see on just our basic light microscope in the microbiology lab and you'd have a very good view of it, say, even on the 10x objective. All right, and this is a, a new yeast cell that is budding off. But then comparing them to E. coli, right, E. coli is actually very small, and you have streptococcus, then you have a very small bacteria cell, rickettsia. Um, this is probably the smallest bacteria cell. And you can see it's quite small relative to the yeast cell. Then you have um, the largest virus, the largest known virus of Mimi virus. And it's quite big, it's actually bigger than uh, this rickettsia bacterium. But then you have all of these other viruses down here. All right, you have herpes simplex virus, rabies virus, you still have that bullet shape that you saw in previous slides. HIV, influenza, adenovirus, the bacteriophage, all right, so this guy is actually going to come up here and attack the E. coli, or it could, poliovirus, yellow fever virus, and then down here, this little dot right there, that is the hemoglobin molecule. So if you think about how many um, millions of hemoglobin molecules are found in a red blood cell, all right, that's huge. I mean, that's a lot. Uh, so that hemoglobin molecule is quite small relative to everything else on this page. All right, so you think about poliovirus, and it's right here, 30 nanometers. There can be um, up to 50 million, in, in terms of size, 50 million poliovirions in one human cell. So that is a lot of virus. And you can fit that, mit, that many into one normal human cell because the viruses are just that small. All right, so real fast, give you a concept check here. Which of the following best describes viruses? Are they heterotrophic, saprobic, obligate intracellular parasites, chemotrophic, photosynthetic? Cue the Jeopardy, tune. And the correct answer, I don't think I have this duplicated. No, the correct answer is actually C, obligate intracellular parasites. Right? If they were saprobic, hopefully you remember that that is a word referred to or used to describe fungi, right? Um, getting their nutrients from dead or dying material. Heterotrophic is going to rely on some other source of nutritional support. Chemoautotrophic, utilizing chemicals, but can rely on self. Photosynthetic, utilizing the sun and chloroplasts. All right, so then, this is just a very small um, figure. It doesn't even have a figure number in section 5.2. Um, but it gives you a, a very uh, basic a virus structure flowchart, and it's very basic because there actually isn't a whole lot to viruses. You have a virus particle that can be divided into the covering, its exterior, and the exterior twofold, possibly. <clears throat> you have the capsid, and then in some viruses, but not all viruses, you have the envelope, and those are the two exterior components of a virus. Then on the interior of that capsid, you're going to have the central core, which is composed of the nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, never both. 
and sometimes some matrix proteins, and randomly uh, some enzymes, but not all viruses are going to carry their own enzymes. So then, um, virus components um, in a um, description here, you have the capsid. All right, the capsid is called, or the capsid is the protein shell. And we'll look at some pictures of these, and it's simply the protein shell that surrounds the nucleic acid. And then if you have another word called nucleocapsid, all right, the nucleocapsid is both the capsid and the nucleic acid together. So sometimes um, the entire virion, the virus particle, can be the nucleocapsid. If there isn't an envelope, if there aren't interior enzymes, it could all, all that you need is the capsid and the nucleic acid. So here, sorry about that yawn, um, here you have the naked virus. Naked viruses don't have an envelope, so they consist only of a nucleocapsid. All right, then you have an envelope. That can be an external covering of the nucleocapsid. And generally, it's going to be a piece of the host cell membrane. As that virus, that virion, pushes out of the host cell, it accidentally or intentionally pulls part of that membrane around it as it leaves and gives it an extra coat. All right, then you have spikes. Spikes are proteins that project from the nucleocapsid or from the envelope. They're just exterior to the virus particle. And it allows viruses to dock with host cells. So it's basically their ligand to look for a specific receptor on host cell, kind of like the lock and key um, description of a protein and an enzyme. Same scenario with a spike on a virus and a receptor on a host cell. The spike would be the key looking for the proper lock in order to gain entry into the host cell. All right, then the word virion, a fully formed virus that is able to establish an infection in a host cell. All right, now mind you, it has to be the proper host cell, um, but the virion is the entire mature particle of the virus. So there are five bolded words on this slide, excluding the title, and you need to be able to define all of these. All right, not writing them out in terms of definition, but if they were to show up on a multiple choice type question or true false, you would need to be able to recognize the correct answer. All right, so generalized structure of viruses. Figure 5.3, right, on the left with the naked virus, very simple virus here, All right, the simplest form, and it simply has the nucleic acid, the capsid, and this guy has a spike. All right, so that would be con that would be called the nucleocapsid. And then in B on the right, you have an envelope that surrounds the nucleocapsid. So those are naked and the envelope. All right, and I don't know why it's it's called envelope. It's not called clothed. You have naked and clothed, but it is naked and envelope. So the capsid is the skin of the virion. Right, it's the most prominent feature of the virus. It's going to be the most, if you were to um, look at it by um, weight, if you could ever do such a thing, or uh, by volume. Right, the capsid would be the most, the biggest part of the virus, and it's composed of identical protein subunits called capsomeres. So that's also another word um, to remember. Capsomeres are the individual protein subunits that come together to create the capsid. And it's act, they're actually quite cool um, to think about because these capsomeres spontaneously self-assemble into the finished capsid. And not only do they have to spontaneously self-assemble, but they also have to do that with the nucleic acid on the interior. All right, if we look at the enveloped virus, all right, the enveloped virus takes a bit of 
the membrane when they leave this host cell. And so the enveloped virus can actually bud from or escape from the host cell as um, its location. So then if it were to be in the cytoplasm and want to leave the host cell, it would pop through the cell membrane. It could, if it was being created within the nuclear or within the nucleus, it would have, it would pull its envelope from the nuclear envelope. And then if it were within the endoplasmic reticulum, got into there and was being processed, excuse me, it would, um, as it moved through the layers of the endoplasmic reticulum, it would also pull its envelope from there. All right, so table 5.2 gives you some examples of the capsid structure. And yes, it says capsid structure. This could also um, overall really be virus structure as well um, because the capsid is the structure. And so here you have helical capsids. All right, they're in a helical or circular fashion. And it's this one is naked. All right, so it's just a picture of the um, tobacco mosaic virus. And here you have an envelope virus. All right, it's just circular. It has the um, nucleocapsid. It has the, um, um, sorry, the envelope on the exterior here. And then it has the spikes coming out. All right, you can see a nice diagram of this going on here. All right, then you have the um, icosahedral capsid. All right, the icosahedral are 20 sided figures. All right, they have 12 evenly spaced corners, and the capsomeres simply come together and form the icosahedral capsid. This guy is naked, so no envelope, and this is a picture of the adenovirus. Then um, the icosahedral capsid in an envelope. All right, you have the DNA core here, and you have hepatitis virus here, and then you have herpes simplex virus on the right. You have the um, the capsid that you can't see, but it's in this blue layer. It's hard to see. You have the DNA in the middle of the cell, and it looks, I don't know, it kind of looks funny relative to some of them because it looks like the entire capsid is full of DNA, and that's actually true because herpes viruses in general have a lot of genes. They have a lot of genetic material. And so you have, if I can find my cursor, there we go. You have the um, genetic material in red. You have the capsid in the blue. And then you have the envelope, the complete envelope in green and yellow. Then you have complex capsids. And this guy is complex. This is a phage. All right, this virus is going to infect bacteria, and this is really what it looks like. It has the nucleic acid up here in what's called the capsid head, and then it has a collar on it, it has a sheet, it has tail pins and a base plate, and then it has tail fibers. The tail fibers are going to be what is going to get along the surface of the bacteria cell, and you see these um, the bends in the in the tail fibers, those will actually bend down so that the tail pins can lock onto the surface of the bacteria cell. And then through uh, some signals and events that scientists don't fully understand, the um, tail pins lock onto the bacteria cell, pulls it to it, and the nucleic acid is moved through the sheath into the bacteria cell. And this is the end.